Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Today we are here at Tarbiya School in the presence of extraordinary, well-known Imams with great reputation. Today we are going to focus on the challenges of the newly reverted Muslims, particularly in the U.S. and more so in this part of the country where we are living. I'm going to do a brief introduction of our guests today. I will start with Imam Shibli on my right. Uh, at present, uh, he is Imam of Islamic Society of Central Jersey. Next, uh, on my immediate right, is Brother Fahim Karim. Uh, his professional job is uh, as a business consultant. Uh, he has done some practical things to, to help uh, newly reverted uh, Muslims. Now I will move to the le my left and I will start with Brother Tariq Abdul Rashid. Uh, I had the opportunity to pray uh, Friday prayer with him when he was leading the prayer. I was very impressed with his thoughts and his clarity of mind. And I'm sure you will also enjoy his discussions. On my extreme left is Brother Shadid Muhammad, a graduate of Islamic University of Medina. And at present, he's serving as the Imam of the United Muslim Masjid, where he has been Imam since December of 2010 in Philadelphia. I would first ask Brother Imam to set up the stage for today's discussion. I will go to the time of Adam and Noah and Ibrahim and Ismail and all those noble prophets because all of them, Dr. Salim, they were Muslims. And Ibrahim, alayhi salam, when he put the foundation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala house in Makkah al-Mukarramah many, many years before Rasulullah sallallahu was born to go to the cave of Hira to invite Khadija radhanullah sallam to invite all Abu Bakr and Umar and Usman and Ali and all the Sahaba to Islam, Ibrahim alayhi salam prayed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on his behalf, on behalf of his son Ismail, on behalf of his wife, wife Ajat, and he said, Oh Allah, this is the Muslim. I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for them to raise the foundation of Allah's house and the generation will come after them or from, the, from them, they have to be Muslim. And which means that Islam, it's not only start by our beloved Prophet Muhammad وسلم, for our information, but the Islam going back all the way down to the time of uh, Noah, Ibrahim, Isa, Musa, to all the Prophet. To, to answer, inshallah ta'ala, your request about to put the comment related how Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam got the wahi, yes, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he lived 40 years in Mecca al mukarrama without no any wahi, which means wahi, revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The people around him in those 40 years, as a young man, as a businessman, as a trade man, as a husband, as a leader among the, among the people of Mecca, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala helped the non-Muslims who lived in his town to honor him with two titles. One of them, as sadiq because he used to say the truth all the time, and al Amin, he was a trustworthy man. And when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala called upon him in the cave of Hira by the first five verses, Iqra bismi rabbika alladhi khalaq, khalaq al insana min alaq, Iqra wa rabbuka al akram, alladhi allama bil qalam, allama al insana ma lam ya'lam, which means just the roughly meaning of the first couple verses, O oh Muhammad, read in the name of your Lord, the one who taught you to read, taught you to learn, and he created the mankind, Rasulullah took this verses to Khadija, Rudwanullah alayha, and all our scholars, and I hope the Imam can correct me if I'm mistaken, Khadija was the first human being in Mecca al-Mukarramah to believe 
Muhammad sallam, he is not a liar, he is not as a magician, he is not a kahan. Through her experience with him for 40 years, and when he invited her to the Islam, she accepted the Islam. Then Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, and one of the saying about Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, how Abu Bakr al-Siddiq accepted the Islam only because he knew who's Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa through his business, through his marriage, through his trade, as his neighbor and a friend. But your focus about to say, let me go to back to Ali bin Abi Talib. Here's an interesting story about Ali, radiyallahu an, wa karramallahu jam, skipping Osman and Umar for a while. Ali Radwan was a very young man. And here in this town, in America, in everywhere, we have many, many young kids. Subhanallah, they understand the Islam and they come to the masjid to say, Imam, I want to convert to Islam, I like to be a Muslim. Prophet Muhammad sallam, when he saw Ali interested to accept the Islam, he said to him, Ya Ali, did you ask permission from your parents? And here I will say, in the Islamic society of Central Jersey, I did apply this method to say, for any young boy, any young girl, will come to the masjid under the age of 18, because this is the legal age in the United States, I said, did you talk to your mom? Yes, my mom support me. Can you bring your mom or your dad when you like to declare the shahada to be present in front of the camera of Allah first, then in the camera of the masjid, because we have a camera in the masjid, and one of the case, just to say what Rasulullah did to Ali bin Abi Talib to ask a permission from his parent before he declared the shahada, I have a female priest in my area, her son is a Muslim, and when her son accepts the Islam, she was a present to, to don't be sure her son will be a Muslim, alhamdulillah. Going back to the last comment to say, yes, we are in America, we have to welcome those individuals, and we have to work with them according to the seerah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I will now turn to Brother Shadid Muhammad. Uh, if you could please uh, take the discussion further, obviously, even early on uh, when people were accepting Islam, there were a lot of difficulties they had to face. If you could please elaborate. There are a lot of correlations between, or well, a lot of similarities between the time in which the Prophet ﷺ received revelation and the time that we are living in today. From amongst those similarities is uh, the fact that Islam was new. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Bada al Islam Ghariba wa sayyaudu kama bada al Ghariba fatuba lil Ghurba. That Islam started off strange and alien. Strange, strange religion. Um, look at the time and you know the demographic amongst the people in which this religion emerged and what the people were engaged in, following their desires, oppression of women, and I mean the atrocities they go on and on. And you look at the, the, the spread of Islam here in America today. It starts off very strange. You know, people see you in a supermarket with a thobal. They see you growing beards. They're seeing Muslims flocking to, you know, Masajid for prayer, wondering, you know, what is going on. So there's a lot of similarities. Um, when we look deep inside the community of the Prophet ﷺ, people were embracing Islam, not necessarily because the Prophet ﷺ was going out giving da'wah, because he couldn't even go out and give da'wah in public. There was a time when the vast majority of the ten, the ashram mubashirin bil jannah, the vast majority of the ten that were promised paradise accepted Islam at the hands of Abu Bakr, not at the hands of the Prophet So there, there were a lot of you know, restrictions there. How did the people, how were the people embracing Islam? How were they being introduced to Islam? And, and here we can debunk a myth that you know, even Muslims have bought into, and that Islam was spread by the sword. Islam was never spread by the sword. Islam was spread by good character. Khuluq al-Hasan, good character. People would hear about the Prophet Sallallahu character and, you know, be so impressed with what they heard that they would embrace Islam solely based upon that fact alone. So when you look at today as Muslims, you know, living in here in America, the spread of Islam, um, it, it, the, the major cause for the spread of Islam after the fadl of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, after the, the blessing and the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, has to be through the character of the Muslim. The way that we carry ourselves, the way we represent Islam. Because that is our, as they say, bread and butter. That is, that is, that is our sink line and hook 
You know, this is how we draw people into the religion by the way that we carry ourselves. And there are many verses in the Quran, the Sahaba weren't even allowed to fight in the beginning stages of Islam. Even all of the oppression and the, the, you know, the, um, the atrocities that were done to them, including the Prophet wasallam, he was praying at the Kaaba and he went down into sujood and Abu Jahl and some of the chiefs of Quraysh were talking of who would grab um, a bucket full of pig intestines and dump it on the back of Muhammad. And they dumped it on the back of the Prophet wasallam while he was in sujood. Did he jump up and fight someone? Did he jump up and curse someone? Did he jump up? No. Abu Bakr who he ran over there, he pushed it off of the back of the Prophet and he said, Ataqtulu Rajulan, Ayyakuda Rabbi Allah. Will you kill a man simply because he said Allah is his Lord? Will you kill a man simply because he says Allah is his Lord? They use logic and they, as Allah says in the Quran, Idfa' billatihi ahsan, that you repel evil with what is better. Because in certain instances, that is the best method. That is the best way to approach a situation. And then in some instances, um, to you know, take back your haq, to go and get what is yours, is the best way. So when you look at the you know, beginning stages of Islam, it was more so about representing Islam and the character of the Muslim as opposed to um, you know, uh, highlighting or accentuating the beautiful tenets of the religion. You know, we tend to say we're going to take this religion out to the non-Muslims and we're going to tell them about zakat and we're going to tell them about hajj and we're going to tell them about this and this and this and then we forget about husn khulq. We forget about good character. People, as, as I'm just going to step outside of the Islamic realm for a second, 70% uh, of communication is non-verbal. Which means that the vast majority of what people are paying attention to is not what you're saying. 70% of communication is nonverbal, which means that people are not so impressed with what comes out of your mouth, but they're more impressed of your character and how you carry yourself. Thank you very much, uh, Jazakallah. Now I will turn to uh, Imam uh, Tariq. Um, if I could take this opportunity to ask you, what has been your experience and briefly, if you could go back to the time when uh, you were not a Muslim and uh, what motivated you to the world? Basically, um, I was raised Christian. And I remember my first encounter with a brother, his name was Shabash. And he uh, came to me and he spoke. He said, you know, you'll make a good Muslim. He said, I said, well, I believe in God. He said, well, what do you say about Jesus? I said, well, they say he's the son of God. So he told me the story of Maryam. And when he told me the story of Maryam, I felt the tears bowling in my eyes. And I actually believed him. Had no doubt what he was saying was the truth. And some of the challenges that I had, basically, my family, when I embraced it, uh, my aunt, she told me, how could you leave your forefather's religion? Exactly what I read in the Quran, that when they say, when Allah says, follow what Allah and His Messenger has sent, they say, no, we shall follow our forefathers. And she said that to me. Why did you leave the religion of your forefathers? And one day, you know, I sat and I told her, uh, the reason, one of the reasons is that I showed her some verses in the Bible that was very confusing and no preacher could ever answer it. You know, and so therefore we went into the chapter and I said, well, this is one of the reasons why because you told me that this was the word of God, and God, there's no contradiction. And there was a few contradictions that we went over. In fact, her husband believed what I was saying. Although he was a Baptist, he never took shahada or anything, but he said, yeah, he's right. Thank you very much. Jazakallah. Uh, I think we have quite a base of uh, information from all different perspectives. So it is a good time for me to ask uh, Brother Fahim Karim uh, that what has been your experience uh, actually dealing with uh, helping the newly reverted Muslims? Uh, um, dealing with the new reverted Muslims, uh, Alhamdulillah, it's been an honor and really a, a blessing to be a part of their uh, journey. Um, and uh, while we go through that journey, we share the experiences with them. The challenges that I have seen, uh, for one example that comes in mind, is not enough people participating in the process of embracing the deen. 
Uh, for example, there's one brother who took Shahada uh, in March, but he's an elderly gentleman, but we don't have enough people to go and visit him and things like that. And those, I find, are the challenges. Uh, but at the same time, I am uh, very positive that they are very much willing to learn uh, new things that, that about the religion. Uh, and so they do come to our class. And alhamdulillah, uh, in this community, we now have new Muslim uh, classes on every Saturday at Masjid Ibrahim. And what we offer there are the very basics about Islam. So we will go through the, uh, the first the tahara, the wudu, how to perform salah, and tawheed. Uh, and these are the very basic foundations we try to focus on. Because we feel that if the foundation is strong, inshallah, then we will be able to build on, on, on that. Uh, and alhamdulillah, we do have some good participation in that program. And the new Muslims that are embracing, they're very strong. And the more knowledge they acquire, alhamdulillah, we are noticing that they benefit. Uh, my goal personally from giving that class along with my brother Azra, who would have loved to be here as well, but unfortunately he's busy. Uh, so we, what we notice is that we want to actually create teachers. So it doesn't have to be me and brother Azra giving the class. But the ones who are participating in the class, we are now encouraging them to teach Tawheed to the new next Muslim who comes to the class. Teach them how to do Tahara. So that is an ongoing process and it doesn't become a burden. And, and I, I see that as an example from Prophet Muhammad because he is the greatest leader of all. And they say in the, in the corporate uh, America, if you want to judge leadership, you should judge leadership by what happens to an organization when the leader leaves. Mm -hmm. right? You and I are all going to be gone. But what happens to our legacy after we have left it? So our job, I think, as a, as a, as a, as a helper of the new Muslims is to not only uh, share with them and uh, our love and our knowledge, but also empower them to lead the banners. Because ultimately, the ones who led the banner, why the reverse? The, shah the Sahabas were all reverse. Uh, you know, and they look at the contribution and how far they brought us. Uh, so the first question I have, and this is on behalf of my new brothers and sisters who are watching and will be listening, inshallah, to Islam. Uh, what are the things that they should be mindful of when they first embrace Islam? And that can be in terms of what to expect from their new Muslim brothers and sisters, and at the same time, what to expect from their family members who just found out they've become Muslim. Hey brother, uh, Fahim put three questions together. Well, first, the first thing is, uh, what does those brothers and sisters who come to the Islam, uh, they want us to do for them or what they are waiting from us. Number one, inshallah ta'ala, I will say to those individuals who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless them by give them the hidayah, give them the guidance to declare I bear witness there is no God worthy of worship except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and I bear witness Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we encourage them to read and read and read and reflect what they are reading from right sources about Islam, not about Muslim. And I agree with my two respect, my Imam, to my extreme left side to say, no, don't take the Islam from Muslims, but take the Islam from the right source. Don't judge the Islam by the Muslim, but judge the Muslim by the Islam. Which means the first step for them, I will say, read, reflect, Take a note, study the Islam. This is before you come to the masjid to say, I want to convert. And for my request to my, our audience, our viewer, our host in the masjid, English is not my mother language. I speak Arabic, alhamdulillah, little bit of French. I will say one thing, inshallah ta'ala, we don't have Quran in English. We don't have Quran in Spanish. We don't have Quran in different languages. We have the translation. And the translation are misleading. I said it million times. Misleading some of those individuals who come to Islam because we want to teach them, I mean, the Arabic language as much as we can to let them understand the vocabulary of the Quran, not the meaning. You ask me why? Because sometimes when I try to talk to them about Allah, and my tongue will switch to the word God. Maybe some of them will still think Imam Shibli is talking about Jesus a God, Jesus the Son of God, Jesus at an eternity, and they think oh, we have three gods in Islam. You know, well, I like to say I want them to read and take a note and ask question. Second thing, what they are waiting from us as a Muslim, maybe we were before them 
and believe me, I believe in the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam as the saying of Rasulullah, كل مولود يولد على الفطرة فأبوا إما أن يهودانه أو ينصرانه أو يمجسانه. The child will born in Delaware, born in Mecca المكرمة, born in Moscow, born in Atlanta, Georgia, born anywhere. That child is a Muslim because he does not born with the original sin. He was innocent, but maybe the masjid or the church or the synagogue or the other house of God or the parent will direct him or her to adopt that kind of tradition. That is my concern to say, no, when you were born, you were born Muslim. And my two respect, Imam, Jazakumullah Khair, you did not convert it, you did not change your religion, you did not change your color, you were born Muslim, but sometimes we miss the exit. In the New Jersey Turnpike, for a while, I have to make a U-turn and pay the toll and come back to my <laughs> GPS, if my GPS was not helping me. And finally, I will say, Masajid, a school, a Tarbiya school, we have to open our hand and our heart to accept them with all their sin. Because there is no great sin in the eyes of Allah, Allah will never forget it, forgive it. And Allah mentioned in Surah Al-Nisa twice, إن الله لا يغفر أن يشرك به ويغفر ما دون ذلك. Other verses, إن الله يغفر الذنوب جميعا. Which means we don't want to welcome them. As as a sinner, they say you are a sinner. You have to be Muslim. Allah will forgive you. No, inshallah Taala welcome them. We open our hand to them. What they are expecting from us, just to tell them you are our brothers. You are our sister. I will take them to my home. I will take the masjid and I will never separate myself from them as some the tradition they do it. And I will say Allah knows the best, inshallah. As for the new shahada, he has to understand that transitioning from one religion to another religion or from one belief to another belief, um, that is abnormal. People don't normally change their faith. Yeah. You understand what I'm saying? So that's the first thing that we have to understand is that that transition from one belief to another belief is something that is, you know, is abnormal. So what, me, what that means is that that transition, um, it requires a lot emotionally, internally. Um, new Shahada, such as myself, we go through a period of what's called separation anxiety, where you were living a particular lifestyle and you became comfortable with that lifestyle. You created what's called a comfort zone. And you were comfortable because it only required a little bit of you and the, the, you know, the possibility of, of hurt was, was very minimal. You, you come out of that comfort zone into a whole other religion. Very strange people, strange faces, strange customs, strange traditions. You, you understand what I'm saying? In every Muslim culture, whether it's Pakistani, Arab, African American, you name it, they all have their own idiosyncrasies. Yeah, you understand what I'm saying? A lot of it has nothing to do with Islam. Most of it has to do with their own cultural and traditional habits. Uh, nonetheless, that new Muslim, that new convert, is confronted with a lot. And I would say to the new convert to understand that, that change is, is something that takes time. Um, and it's, it's, it's not going to be an overnight process. It is something that is in, like new shahadas, we become Muslim and then we look at the Muslims and we say, wow, I want a long beard like that. Wow, where can I get one of those, you know, and we go after and, and we, we skip the smaller steps, like understanding Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, developing that, that connection, that ilaqa, that, that ilaqa qalbiya, that, 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 heartful, that heartfelt connection to God. You understand what I'm saying? Because most of us, when we came from Christianity, um, and I'm going to speak for myself first and foremost, that coming from Christianity, like there was no heartfelt connection to God. Because there was no connection to God. There was a connection to Jesus. Yeah. You understand what I'm saying? And even Christians today, you'll hear them say, oh, Lord Jesus, when something happens. Hasha wa kalla. But, but this is what they say. All right? Um, and so there was no connection to God because Jesus was always the intermediary. So they, they stop at Jesus. So then when they become Muslim, and there has to be a direct connection between the, the servant and his Lord, 
All right, that is the primary thing that they need to focus on, and to understand that that is a process. That you know, I, I you know, prayed for 20 years. You know, what I'm saying I, I forced myself. Jahad to nafsi out of salah, ishrin the center, hatta estadir ishrin the center. That I struggled with myself to perfect my prayer for 20 years, and so that I could relax and enjoy the prayer for the next 20. You understand what I'm saying? Jahad to nafsi ishrin the center, hatta estadir ishrin the center. I struggled with myself. For 20 years so that I can relax for the next 20 years. So it's an internal jihad. It's an internal struggle that a lot of not new Muslims, new converts to Islam, they skip that process. And they go straight to growing a beard. They go straight to wearing a thobe. And they go straight to, you know, affiliating with this masjid and this masjid and these group of people. But that doesn't change who you were. Changing who you were is a, is, a, is a personal initiative that you have to undertake. Nobody can do that for you. You understand what I'm saying? You have to be able to, you know, as the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Al-Mujahid li nafsi, kal mujahid fi sabili that the person who struggles with himself, struggle to make himself conform, his nafs conform to the religion, is like a person who's fighting in the cause of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Because that internal struggle, that internal fight, it is the real fight. That is the real fight because that internal struggle prepares you for any external struggle. The struggle with the dunya. The struggle with shaitan, the struggle with anything else that is going to come. You cannot confront that until you confront yourself first and foremost. And this is what a lot of new Muslims, they miss that, that segment. They miss that portion of their conversion, their transition. And so you'll find them five, six, seven years into Islam and they still function like new shahabas. Five, six, seven, eight years they've been Muslim. You ask the brother, how long have you been Muslim? Well, I did the Fatiha. And he doesn't even, can't even recite Al Fatiha perfect. And he's been Muslim seven years, ten years. You ask him some of the basics of wudu. You ask him some of the basics. As Imam Shafi, um, one of his students came to him and asked him about something. He was delving deep in some of the, in, you know, in, matters of the unseen related to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Imam Shafi said, before I ask you the question, I'm going to ask you some questions about wudu. He asked him some questions about wudu. So the, the student, he said he didn't answer any question right. So Imam Shafi said, I'll take it further and I'll break the question about wudu. I'll break it down into five different sub-questions. He said that I wasn't, I didn't answer any of the questions right. And Imam Shafi says, subhanAllah, shay'in tahtaju ilayhi khamsa marrat fil yawm la tujiduhu wa tas'al an ilmi Allah that something you are in need of five times a day that you're ignorant of. But then you're asking me about something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not make you, will not make you accountable or responsible for nothing. So this is the same thing. Imam Shafi was drawing his attention to what was more important. And I think that with new shahadas, we have lost that focus. The focus is, mashallah, you need to, you know, put on a throat. Or brother, you know, you shouldn't wear jeans. Khalli, khalli, wali, leave the jeans alone. Don't worry about his jeans, don't worry about his beard. Worry there is about no him. Jesus in Islam, brother. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, those things are not important. Those things will change by default of him changing his heart. Those things will change by default. When the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam called people to Islam, he didn't say, you know, do you have a girlfriend? Or do you get high? Do this, do this, do this, do this, do this. No. I mean, th there were narrations where some of the Sahaba, on their Lord, they were still drinking, even, you know, after, you know, they accepted Islam. Like the hadith that's in Sahih al-Bukhari, in the chapter of Iman, where the man, uh, uh, his name was Abdullah. You laqa bil himar. They used to call him... Jack, you know the, yeah. the rest of it, yeah. okay, in English. In Arabic, is himar, yeah. okay? And he used to drink. Kana yashrab al-khamar. Wa yudhik in Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to laugh at his jokes. But they would reprimand him for doing so. And on one occasion, one of the Sahaba, he couldn't take it anymore. And this is the danger of allowing your iman to blind you to the humanness of people. He said to the man, how many times are you going to be brought in front of the Prophet Sallallahu like this? Allahumma al May Allah curse you. The Prophet Sallallahu said, la tal'anuhu. Don't curse him. If wa fi riwayatin qala la tu'inu shaytan ala akikum. Wa hadha al-mawdi shahid. Annahu ma zala musliman. Ma dama annahu yashhad anna Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wahid. Wa anna Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam huwa al-nabi. Fahuwa muslim. That he said to the Prophet ﷺ, the Prophet ﷺ said, don't curse him. And in another narration he said, don't aid the shaitan against your brother. 
And that is the point, the purpose that Imam al-Bukhari brought that hadith in the chapter of Iman, because it's to show that even though the Muslim is engaging in major sin, so as long as he knows that it is a sin, it does not remove him from the fold of Islam. However, Muslims, we remove people from the fold of yes. Islam. We say, oh, you drink khamar, you drink this, you drink this, you're not a Muslim. You're not a real Muslim. Who are you to decide whether somebody is a real Muslim or not? That is that is not your that is not your uh, you know your calling you know as the Prophet sallallahu he mentioned a hadith about a man who said to another man that Allah will never forgive you and Allah subhanahu wa taala said man yet ta'ala who's going to put themselves in place of God you're playing God now to determine who's Muslim who's not Muslim that's not your job that's not your job to determine to discern who's Muslim who's a real Muslim who's not a real Muslim shatnuka anta Pay attention to your own self. You're, you're, you don't have anything to do with anybody else. As Allah says in the Quran, alaykum wa anfusakum, that, you know, focus on your own self. And that if somebody else decides to go astray or somebody has some other things that they're struggling with, that is not, and that's for us as Muslims who encounter the new shahada. Because the new shahada, they come with a lot of things. They, they're still grappling with a lot of issues. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in he met a young man, and the young man said, I can do everything from Islam with the exception of zina. It's that then if it's zina. Give me permission to commit zina. Now, if someone was to ask an imam something like that today, we would be up in arms. Do what? Zina is haram. We would put him out of sight of the fold of Islam as quick as he came into Islam. But that is the, those are the issues that new shahadas are grappling with. He said that I can do everything from Islam with the exception of zina. Give me permission. Did the Prophet وسلم, scold him? Did he reprimand him? Did he say, Astaghfirullah, and together? No. He asked him. He said, Alaka um, do you have a mother? The man said, Yes. Now. He said, I would to ummik. Would you like someone to commit adultery with your mother? And the man said, No. He said, Well, Kadarika, Nas Lahu Umahatum. What are you hippuna daddy kali umahatihu? He said, likewise, people have mothers and they don't want people to fornicate with their mothers. He said, Alaka Ucht, do you have a sister? And so he went all the way down the line with all of the closest women to him, to the man he got it. He got it. He used logic. He didn't say, Stuff for Allah, here's the ayah in the Quran, Zina is haram, la taqrabu zina that because that's what we do. We do that to new shahadas. A new shahada, they don't, they don't have the reverence, that ta'zim for the, for the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at this stage in their deen. So quoting an ayat, quoting a hadith to them, they don't understand that. You use logic with them to get them to understand that that is not appropriate. As a Muslim, you, you have to do better than that. You have to be better than that. You represent something greater than yourself. This is not about you. This is about God. This is about Allah and Allah's religion. And they get it. You know, they get it. So, you know, this is twofold for the new shahada as well as the, the Muslim, you know, who confronts the new shahada or encounters the new shahada. Um, Brother Tariq, uh, you already gave your insight, mashallah, beautifully. If you could kindly build on a little bit on uh, what are the, some of the other shahadas that you've seen, what are the challenges they can expect from the family? Uh, yeah, well, one of the things also that, to keep in mind is that the new shahadas, their challenge, of course, a lot of them have to go back to their mothers and fathers and things of that nature. And so therefore, one thing they should keep in mind is not when they become Muslim, they want to change the whole process in the home, start taking down the pictures, you know, I don't eat pork anymore, and all the whole works, you know, uh, because basically, again, as you know, Shadi was saying, you know, change is a process, not an event. So things uh, take time, you know, and a lot of times uh, they get zealous. You know, and things of that nature. So it, the, the best way for the new shahada is to, again, based on the teacher too. Because a lot of times we uh, invite people to Islam, right? It's like when we go in the street, we see a guy we ain't seen in a long time. Hey, let me get your number. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I'll be calling you. You never hear from me. So sometimes new shahadas come in the same way that we don't, we expect them to be on the level that we are. You know, and so therefore we invite them in Islam, but we don't give them that the initiative to, to keep them together. So like when we were doing the latter, we had this uh, new converts, no new converts left behind. You know, and basically it was to 
network with them. How about include the other Muslim? No Muslim will be <laughs> behind because the Muslims they have to be <laughs> reconverted to convert to Islam. Yeah. Yeah. Alhamdulillah, yeah. Sheikh. Yeah. 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 have to bring them back to Islam. Islam. Yeah. So Alhamdulillah, so we try to network with keeping them, having them come to classes yeah. and things like that so they can learn properly because another thing is that uh, we, we look at them thinking that they understand, you know, not knowing the level of their knowledge, the level of the background. The prehistoric background is very important uh, because a lot of times you've been living 25 years of Jahili, ignorance, and then you come into Islam only two years and we expect them to be on, on the level of Islam, but yet they've been doing this for a certain long time. And, you know, we already set up for contradictions in our lives from Christianity, we were taught to believe. The belief wasn't connected to our, you know, action, you know. So uh, trying to give them a, a strong foundation of the oneness of Allah, the ilm al mukashafa having this intuitive knowledge and relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and and ilm al amal the, the social conduct of, of applying that, you know, and things like that. So it's very important that we uh, keep the non uh, converts into perspective in the classes, teaching them the Islam, and not just some one day they come to Juma and things like that, but teaching them effectively. You know, I think that's very important for us to to help them. And and they're expecting us to, to, to lead them in a correct manner. But we ourselves have to be led ourselves and the right information. You know, um, again, you know, sometimes they come in with the earrings and quickly, you know, this is haram. They come sometimes they pray with the shirt. You know, as he gave the example, and also the man who urinated in the masjid, yes. you know, if that was to happen today, yes. imagine what would happen, yes. you know, not being patient and understanding on the level of the individuals. So, you know, it's very important that we keep that in mind. Right? Uh, uh, towards the end, uh, Fahim, I will uh, ask you to briefly tell us uh, your experience working with the newly uh, words. Sure. And uh, but the specific challenges that you had to deal with, and yeah. if you feel that uh, still your questions have not been answered, yeah. uh, our kind imams are with us, and we sure. can ask them. You can ask them one. Sure, Jazakallah. I, I do have one follow-up question for them. Uh, from my experience, Alhamdulillah, in the Delaware community, uh, our masjids are very welcoming, Alhamdulillah, to the new Muslims. Uh, anytime there is a brother or a sister who is uh, looking to find out information, uh, we are easily uh, reaching out to the people who can provide them with the right information and trying to get them the right source of knowledge. Uh, and also, same time, we're blessed with having good scholars in our community, uh, which helps us making sure that we're giving them the right knowledge uh, to them. Uh, but the challenges that we've seen sometimes is that once they take the shahada, we don't see them. Uh, and sometimes they may go to a masajid that might say, well, don't go to that masajid. They may not be, you know, things like that. So that, that's one of the challenges uh, that I feel sometimes is there. Uh, but at the same time, for those who are really serious, they come to our class. Uh, and not only that, they are working hard to gain the basic knowledge uh, and trying to make sure that they are able to uh, share the information uh, with others as well uh, that they are able to understand. Because we, we encourage them to not only just learn, but to be thinking of themselves as a teacher. Uh, when, I, when we instruct them, uh, share the information with me and Brother Azra, we tell them that, listen, today I'm in the front here talking to you, but please, when you're taking notes, take notes as if you're going to be teaching, teaching this class. Because one day, me and Brother Azra is not going to be here, and we would need one of you to please step up and teach this class. And that's what I, I feel is, is, is our, our role to coach them, inshallah, in that aspect. Um, the challenge, I think, is also that I think we as Muslims, like Imam Shibli was saying, we don't really appreciate what we have. I think that's a deeper thing I grab from it. Because if, like, you no, know, I give the example of uh, one of the scholars, he says something beautiful. If you have an iPhone, and you know those features of that iPhone, you will be, and if somebody tells you, I'm gonna give you a million dollar commission for every single phone you sell, you'll be selling that phone left and right, day and night, because you know all the features. But we, as a community, have really neglected this area of inviting and also participating in really taking care of our new brothers and sisters. I think that is, we need to do a better job at it. Uh, mainly because I think we ourselves don't appreciate uh, what we have, the, the benefit that Allah will give us. Because number one, the one person who's really benefiting from this class, I think is myself. 
I, don't, I can't talk about others. I'm learning the very basics of Tawheed. Because how can I teach? Because I myself am learning it, Alhamdulillah. So I, I recommend for those brothers and sisters who are listening from our community to please come to the class. And I actually don't like to call it a new Muslim class. I call it a Muslim continuing education class. The, the Muslim continuing yeah, I think with, um, with a, a Christian coming and asking to differentiate between God and Jesus, I think you have to start with Jesus. Start with who he's not. As in the Kerima, Shahada, La ilaha, it starts with a negation. So we start with who Allah is not. And then by default, we you know exclude everything which only leaves Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, you know, you know, the only one worthy of worship. So when we start with Jesus, who is Jesus? Allah first of all, Jesus is is, is a cre a created human being. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He, he created Adam, just like he created Jesus. A lot of people are amazed with Jesus because they say, oh, he was created without a father. So let's go further than Jesus, and let's look at Adam, the creation of Adam, who uh, was created without a mother or a father. And the fact that Jesus was created without a father does not make God his father. That, that shows the omnipotence of God. It shows the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to do what he wills. If he wants to do something, he just simply say, kun fai, kun be, and it is. It doesn't mean that Jesus is now God's son, you know, because, and I think with, with Christians, when they materialize God in the form of Jesus, it is indicative of their weak faith. Because faith is supposed to be in something you can't see. That's why it's faith. As Allah says in the Quran to Fir'aun, Al-An, what kind of asaytum in Qabr? Now you believe after you see the punishment right upon you. Now you want to believe. It does you no, it does you no good to believe when you can see. So Christians, because of their weak faith, they materialize God into the form of this man. And obviously the man has to look exactly like them so they can identify. So you see this blonde hair, blue eye, is no other color that Jesus could have been. When I was in Louisiana, <laughs> I used to visit those churches. Jesus, a peace be upon him. He is African-American man in Louisiana. Well, in every religion, Jesus is going to be whatever every religion wants him to be. Yes. If he's a Hispanic, if you're talking to Spanish Hispanics, Jesus is going to be Hispanic. Yes. If you're talking to African-Americans, Jesus is going to be with Afro and a beard and dark skin. So when you, when you go into the concept of you know, debunking who Jesus is not, it automatically clarifies to you who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. You know, so when we say that Jesus is not God, not the son of God, uh, as Allah mentions about Prophet Muhammad, that he is not a kahin, no matter who will be called a kahin, and he's not this, he's not a liar, he's not, and then Allah says, now where are you going to go? After you debunk everything, there's nothing left for you to accept, except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as the only God, the only one worthy of worship. The first experience I got here in the United States in, in 1980, uh, 1982 when I landed down in Louisiana, and subhanAllah, I was lived among the African-American society completely, except few other, uh, you know, uh, minority Muslim in 1911 Santa Claus. And uh, I live with them, I ate with them, I go uh, swimming with them, I go to the island in the middle of the Mexico, Mexico Gulf, you know, 40 miles, you know, in, you know, with those individuals. And when we have this kind of camping, I did ask them, how can I understand you first to help you? Mm -hmm. They gave me some advice. The first advice they told me, if you like to take a note. As long as you are not African American Muslim, you will never ever give them order. They will never accept your order, number one. Mm. Number one. Number two, exactly what of you, Imam said, people will never judge us by our beautiful lecture and beautiful khutbah Jum'ah and beautiful DVD and a nice term. No, they will judge us by your action. If you don't live with them, if you don't sit with them, if you don't attend their marriage, if you don't go to the hospital visit them, you are not one of them. Number three, after I moved to the north, as you know, Jesus is different from north to south, as I see it in all interfaces, and we respect them. We, our neighbor, you know, we never, I mean, uh, say any good word, any bad word except the good word about them. 
uh, uh, one day I find them coming to the Islamic Society of Central Jersey to declare the Shahada. The first thing I have to record in my computer, the name, the address, the telephone number, the background little bit, they give it to me in a little bio as Dr. Salim took our bio to send it to the camera. And every occasion, fundraising dinner, uh, death, uh, marriage, uh, uh, lectures, a conference, uh, Ramadan, we have to invite them with the best card we have it in the market say we did honor you because you are my brother you are my sisters mm -hmm. not only that we are not far away from Rutgers University for the record because in New Jersey is Rutgers Rutgers in New Jersey as you know anyone through the MSA accept the Shahada in the Rutgers we ask the student of Rutgers to bring him to the masjid or bring her to the masjid to the other masjid not only ISCJ we have MCMC we have couple messages to be part of it and I will say finally in the ISCJ recently we have the class, we have everything, but we said every person declared the Shahada in the Mihrab, he has to be adopted by one Muslim brother sitting on the floor, he or sister, not brother and sister, no. I mean, sister to sister, brother to brother. Catch me. You know, to take responsibility about him to follow up, at least in weekly basis. Did he need a jump for his car? Did he need a little food? Did he need white jalabiya? But this is my concern, I said, to keep, communicate with them a 24 hour because this is America. And final, finally, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the technology now. Why have to be a liar? When I say takbir in the mihrab for him, and I say, brother, this is my telephone number, 848-203-2178, this for the record. And I will never call him, and he will call me, I said, I am busy. If you call me, I said, I am busy, and I never call him. How is going to be accepted Islam? Which means, brother, we have to work up to the level of to communicate with those individuals as United States give us the opportunity to be American, to be proud to be Muslim, and American by, you know, uh, not relation, but to say, I have to create a communication line between me and every brother, every person, and my, our message is open for them. And I think that one of the communication, I use it, and I ask Allah to accept it, inshallah. Yes, Allah. To summarize uh, some of the things we learned uh, from our beautiful scholars here, alhamdulillah, uh, is that uh, to encourage, first of all, for our new brothers and sisters in Islam, we encourage uh, you to first read and reflect upon the right sources of knowledge. Uh, rather than delving too much into the outer, outer practice, concentrate more on the inner, the inner self. Because once you engage in understanding the correct, having the correct understanding of Islam, you understand Allah and you are able to connect with Him, then naturally the actions will come very easily. But obviously you start with small, small steps, but the steps that are consistent. Not one step at the beginning at a very fast pace and then losing it, but small, gradual steps, but working with the basics uh, from Tahara, which is like learning how to do evolution, and so on and so forth. Uh, and I also appreciate uh, the feedback is that to engage in the process to understand the language of Arabic. Like the uh, Imam Shibli had mentioned is that Quran, we sometimes make the mistake of saying this is a translation of the Quran. There is actually no translation of the Quran. There is a translation of the meaning of the Quran. So if we want to learn the theme of Allah, we have to engage in learning the Arabic. And I remind myself first because I am also neglectful and I need to do a better job at this. Um, and uh, to transition the change, uh, it takes time. We should not expect, don't expect yourself as a new Muslim and a new uh, brother or sister to have drastic changes. It takes time and we as those who are around you, as older Muslims of, from birth or from culture, we should be more patient and not be uh, expecting you to have drastic changes in your life as soon as you take Shahada. We should be mindful of that. Uh, and we should be, uh, 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 those are the basic things, Alhamdulillah. And for those of us who are in the community, uh, I think it is our, our job to understand our religion much more uh, from the very basics of Tawheed, to be able to explain Islam very clearly when we're asked what is the difference between God and Jesus, and also at the same time participate in engaging uh, those who are in, in, in this community. For example, a beautiful suggestion is whenever somebody takes Shahada, we assign somebody from the masjid to stand up and please take responsibility of keeping in touch. 
because like uh, we have been blessed with this technology in this in the US communication is the key when we engage our new brothers and sisters with constant communication inshallah they will feel more part of the inclusive uh, part of the community uh, it will inshallah help us all as we continue to work um, there are things which uh, I would say I uh, ignored in the past and things have become much more clear to me. I hope uh, this has been a very helpful discussion for everyone and uh, the community at large benefits from it. Uh, once again, I would like to thank all the panelists uh, who are here and uh, may I ask uh, Imam to pray for all of us. I pray to Allah SWT on behalf of the masjid, on behalf of the school, on behalf of our host, May Allah give you the Jannah, may Allah bless you, may Allah bless your family, and if we have any mistake, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness, surely we have a mistake, if we accomplish something today in the house of Allah, maybe Allah reward all of you, and we come with a conclusion to say, A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan rajim Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, wal-asr, inna al-insana lafi khus, illa al-lazina amanu, wa'amilu al-salihat, wa tawasaw bil-haq, wa tawasaw bil-sabr. صدق الله العظيم وآخر دعوانا أن الحمد لله رب العالمين